if uh, crawling around those caves made you feel claustrophobic, then uh, you might like space more. It's expanding. Um, I'm going to talk about, uh, tell you a little bit about how observations of exploding stars called supernovae have revealed that we live in a universe that is not just expanding, but actually expanding faster and faster, uh, propelled by a mysterious newly discovered component of the universe called dark energy. So when we look out at the universe, it looks like it's expanding around us. The universe acts like it received a big kick that we call the Big Bang, and now the galaxies are rushing apart. You could think of this like a giant loaf of raisin bread rising in the oven. The galaxies would be like the raisins, and uh, as it gets bigger, there's more space between uh, more distant raisins. They appear to rush apart even faster. So how do we actually know this about our universe? How do we figure this out? Um, well, uh, as you saw in that animation, we would have to measure how far away the galaxies are around us, and we'd have to measure how fast they uh, appear to be moving away from us to learn this about the universe. Uh, so it turns out the first of those, figuring out how far away galaxies are, is very hard. Uh, to give you some uh, understanding of how you measure distances in space, uh, let me first remind you of how you measure distances here on Earth. Um, on Earth, we use all kinds of tools. Uh, for example, if you want to know the distance to a tree, uh, surveyors determine they might uh, look at that tree compared to a distant mountain and then they would uh, move their equipment over and see how the position of that tree has changed through what angle relative to the distant mountain by setting up some triangles, some simple geometry, you could determine the distance to the tree. A more natural means is a, a lighthouse. Uh, if you're a ship captain, uh, you have an understanding of how luminous a lighthouse is. So when you see one looking very faint, you could judge approximately how far away you are from that lighthouse at night. Now, if it were a foggy night, uh, that lighthouse could look faint and fooling you into thinking it's further away than it really is. So we have tools called foghorns that uh, work by the same principle, the attenuation or reduction of the sound instead of the light over the distance. Hearing a foghorn sound very quiet tells you it's far away. Um, another tool that we all use without even thinking is an understanding of the true physical size of an object so that when it appears small, uh, we can judge how far away it is. So in the case of these airplanes, we understand that the uh, very small airplanes are the same thing just uh, in the background. They are not, for example, baby airplanes that were birthed by <laughs> these larger airplanes. That's just something that we intuitively understand. Um, now, all of these are human-made objects, and so we don't have the use of those in space. So we have to use telescopes and what nature provides. And what nature provides to us is something very similar to the lighthouse, naturally occurring lighthouses that we call standard candles. Um, and our favorite standard candle occurs when there's a galaxy, like the one you see here, that might have 10 or 100 billion stars in it. But at some point in time, one of those stars may explode in what we call a supernova explosion when it's as bright as about 4 billion times the brightness of the sun and provides an excellent standard candle. If you could start the animation for that, I think a supernova is going to go off. Um, there it is. And so as you place that supernova further away, uh, like the lighthouse, we can judge its distance from its brightness. We use what's called the inverse square law, that the brightness will decline as one over the distance squared, as the light going out has to paint the surface of a larger and larger sphere. So if uh, one of these supernovae is twice as far away, it'll appear four times as faint. If it's three times as far away, it'll appear nine times as faint. So we look for these supernovae, and uh, they allow us to measure the distances to the galaxies in which they reside. So how do we measure that other aspect of the animation? The, the fact that it looks like everything is moving uh, away from everything else. Well, um, we can also determine that from the light of these supernovae in a different way. That light is emitted at a certain wavelength. These are wavelengths that we can determine in the laboratory. But as that light travels to our telescopes, the expansion of space stretches the wavelengths of light. It makes that light longer wavelength, that is, 
tilted toward the red end of the spectrum, and so we see a red shift of the light. So this is what it would look like if you had a distant supernova emitting some blue light, and while the light is traveling, space expands and it reaches our observatory, it is already stretched or shifted to the red. And so we can measure that red shift and so every time we see one of these supernovae, these standard candles, we can determine how far away it is and uh, how fast that uh, galaxy is moving away from us. So you might wonder, OK, so the universe is expanding, but what happens after that? What's next in this story? It's a little bit like asking what happens to a cannonball when it's fired from the top of a tall mountain on the surface of the Earth. And the answer is, uh, it depends how fast you fire that cannonball. Uh, it depends also relative to how massive the Earth is. If the Earth is not very massive or you fire the cannonball very fast, uh, the cannonball will escape the Earth's gravitational pull. It will go out into space. If the cannonball is not fired very fast or the Earth is very heavy, it will fall back down. Um, and uh, in both cases, although the cannonball is slowing down, the specific velocity uh, needs to be determined to know whether it is what we call the escape velocity. That that knife edge case between the cannonball that will go out forever or the one that will fall down. So uh, this is what we expected after discovering that the universe was expanding when that was discovered by Edwin Hubble uh, in 1930, that although expanding, the expansion would be slowing down. Now that wasn't always the understanding though. Even before Hubble observed that the universe was expanding, back in 1916, Einstein was thinking about the universe. He was thinking about it in the context of a new theory he had of gravity called general relativity. And Einstein made one of his few mistakes. Uh, he was under the mistaken impression that the universe was static, that it was immutable, that it wasn't getting bigger or getting smaller. But he realized that if the universe were in that state, then all the attractive gravity from all the stuff in the universe would cause the universe to start to collapse again. So he didn't know how to keep the universe in that static situation. And he made an amazing discovery enabled by his new theory. Uh, his amazing discovery was, although the gravity of the objects in the universe is attractive, the gravity of the empty space between the objects could be repulsive. And this kind of repulsive gravity could balance the attractive gravity, keep the universe static. Now, he called that repulsive gravity the cosmological constant. And today, we would call it dark energy. Um, now, when Einstein saw that the universe was expanding, when that was shown to him, um, he then called this the biggest blunder of his career that he had made, that to invent this idea of this dark energy when it wasn't needed. Um, so how do we actually measure then if the expansion is slowing down, and if so, by how much? Well, when I told you how we measure the expansion of the universe, I left one crucial piece of information out, which is that when we observe these distant supernovae, these exploding stars, and when they carry this information to us, how far away they are, how fast, uh, the, or how much redshift has been caused by the expansion of space, um, there's a large delay built in. Uh, I like to say that the universe does not instant message. So when you send an instant message on your phone, you think of it as getting there right away. Of course, you know uh, it requires at least the time that it takes the speed of light to reach your friend, but that's a trivial amount. It's not so trivial for the universe. When you are looking at objects that are billions of light years away, it takes billions of years for the light from them to reach us, which means that we are learning about the universe as it was expanding billions of years ago. So when we look at a nearby supernova, that might tell us how fast the universe was expanding a billion years ago. Um, one further away might tell us how fast the universe is expanding two billion years ago, further three billion years ago. So um, what seems annoying is actually incredibly valuable to us. These uh, supernovae uh, carry information about the past by looking further away and allow us to see how that expansion rate of the universe has been changing over time. So uh, about 15 years ago, when uh, I got involved in this work, when I was a graduate student and a postdoc, uh, the expectation was that the universe was either slowing down a great deal, uh, like the universe model on the left, a very heavyweight universe full of matter that was quickly slowing down the expansion. Eventually, the expansion would halt, and then it would start to contract, and the universe would end in a kind of big crunch, the inverse of the Big Bang. Or 
we lived in a lightweight universe. Uh, I, I heard some people, I don't know if they were, sounded nervous about this big crunch. It's <laughs> even at, in the worst case, it would be about 30 billion years from now. Um, but uh, it could have been that we lived in a lightweight universe, uh, one with very little matter in it, and so the universe would expand forever. That is, like the cannonball, the universe would have escape velocity from itself. And so our expectation was we could measure this rate of slowing, like we could measure the slowing of the cannonball, and figure out what the ultimate fate was of the universe. Um, now, the way we sought to do this was to look for some of the most distant supernovae we could find. Uh, and generally, we can find these only with the Hubble Space Telescope. And these very distant supernovae um, give us information from 10 or 11 billion years ago when the universe was only one or two billion years old. And so they allow us to reach way back in the expansion history of the universe. So I think of these supernovae as sort of natural time capsules in the universe. And after hearing Kenny's talk, I sort of think of them almost like the blue holes of our universe because they're the places where we can collect this information that we can't get anywhere else that tells us about the early history of the universe. Um, and so here are a number of pictures showing what a distant galaxy looks like just before a supernova explodes and just after a supernova explodes. People usually ask me, how do we find these supernovae? And I usually remark that if, if you look at the ends of the arrows in the pictures, usually you could find them <laughs> without too much trouble. Um, no, we add those arrows a afterwards, actually. But uh, anyway, so this was one of those really exciting times where uh, both of the prevailing theories were ruled out, and we ended up with a very surprising picture for the universe that the universe was actually accelerating. And this was uh, the breakthrough of the year for Science Magazine in 1998 because, you know, poor Einstein has been yanked back and forth along this whole story. You know, the universe is static. No, now we need stark energy. No, that was a big blunder. No, now we think it exists after all, but that's sometimes the way science goes. So we now think the universe is actually dominated by this dark energy component, the energy of empty space, which causes this repulsive gravity, which causes the universe to accelerate. So after, uh, about a decade, decade and a half of working hard on this, we have arrived at what is on the one hand, the glass is half full story. You know, we've made tremendous progress. We now have labeled every part of the universe. Um, about 0.05% of it is in the form of planets, another 0.5% in the form of stars, another 4% in the form of gas, gas which is made of the elements that you see in the periodic table of elements. So about the whole universe, uh, made of normal stuff, the stuff we're made of, uh, is only about 4.5% of the universe. So it's really quite striking that the, the stuff we're familiar with is really just sort of the frosting on uh, the cake. The majority is 23% uh, in the form of another type of matter that has attractive gravity, but we don't understand uh, the kind of particle that it is made out of, but it is not uh, what I would call normal physics, or the kinds of particles that we're already familiar with. And then there's the even more mysterious component, the dark energy that makes up, now we think about 73% of the universe. And so the, the, I said the glass is half full part of the story is we have finally come to terms with the pie chart of the universe. And uh, the part that's a little frustrating is we don't understand 96%. Of it, so but that, uh, as Kenny said, uh, in this case, this is our job. Security is, uh, you know, our vast ignorance. Um, but anyway, uh, so I think uh, what we are looking forward to over the next decade is experiments and measurements that will help us understand both the nature of the dark matter, the nature of the dark energy, and in all likelihood, from this will come a deeper understanding of gravity and the fundamental laws of physics. And in the past, when we have learned more about the fundamental laws of physics, uh, we've always uh, learned a great deal uh, in the realms of science and technology. So uh, I will end there. Thank you.